book of Colossians this morning. I'm going to get back into Colossians. When I was putting the, uh, the sign up outside, I was, you know, it's not about the do's and don'ts. I was putting it up and I quickly looked at it and said, it's not about the donuts. Oh, no. It's not about the do's and don'ts. I don't know if I had donuts in my mind or what, but every time I see it, it's all I, it's all I see now. I don't know why. <laughs> But it is about the donuts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we're in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, starting at verse 8. It's on page 1234 in your uh, pew Bible, if you're using your pew Bible this morning. Page 1234, 1, 2, 3, 4. Starting at verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him you are also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in, your, in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and, is, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you die with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Our word this morning. Let's pray. Now, the Father God, as we come to our now, Lord, and, and study this word you gave to us, Lord, I, I pray that it can minister to us and that it can help us grow in all areas. And I pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So rules, do's and don'ts, they're, they're everywhere in our society. Right? They, everywhere we look, we, we have rules. And, and they, they help us. You know, they, they guard us from harm normally. They, they give us boundaries of, of what to do or, or don't do. So, so it's no wonder that, that they have become an integral part of the church as well. Whether good or bad, we, we have rules. Now, now, some rules are in place because they were placed there by God and, and should be followed, right? Because he loves us and, and he wants what's best for us, right? Well, others, other rules, they're, they're just man-made extensions of those rules. And usually those rules, rules become overbearing to us and all of us who try to follow them. And, and this is where a lot of people usually fight back against this, this movement. It's usually what we call legalism, what we would call, call legalism. Now, legalism, it, it can be defined as a strict adherence to the law. Specifically, as it relates to faith, as we're going to talk this morning, a, a legalist is one who believes that performance is the way to gain favor with God, right? What you do and don't do is how you gain favor with God. 
Legalism is, is the human attempt to gain salvation to prove our spirituality by outward conformity to a, a list of religious do's and don'ts. It, it's often disguised in Christian terms and behavior. Now, I, I found a, a couple of short stories on those who experience legalism at its finest. And these stories are happen to, to a youth minister and a minister in, in, in a church. Uh, the first story comes from Charles Swindoll's book. Um, and they're really one paragraph stories. This, this book, The Great Awakening, it's a devotional book, and he tells his story in it. He says, one of my favorite stories comes from a man who used to be in our church. When he was a youth worker many years ago in an ethnic community, he attended a church that had Scandinavian roots. Being, rather, being a rather forward-looking and creative young man, he decided he would show the youth group a missionary film. We're talking simple, safe, black and white, religious-oriented movie. Well, the film projector hadn't been off an hour before a group of the leaders in the church called him in and asked him what he had done. They asked, did you show the young people a film? In all honesty, he responded, well, yeah, I did. We don't like that, they replied. Without trying to be argumentative, the youth worker reasoned, well, I remember that at the last missionary conference, our church showed slides. One of the church officers put his hand up, signaling him to cease talking. Then in these words, he emphatically explained the conflict. If it's still, fine. If it moves, sin. You can show slides, but when they start moving, you're getting into sin. Yeah, that's legalism. They probably should have come here for worship on a Sunday morning. <laughs> All right, this is this other story I find funny because it probably could happen in Maine. Not the legalism part, but the way that the pastor got to church. This, this story was told some years ago of a pastor who found the roads blocked one Sunday morning and was forced to skate on the river to get to church, which he did. When he arrived, the elders of the church were horrified that their pastor had skated on the Lord's day. And the audacity of it. Oh, man. After the service, they held a meeting where the pastor explained that it was either skate to church or don't go at all. Finally, one elder asked, well, did you enjoy it? When the preacher answered no, the board decided, ah, it's all right then. <laughs> as long as you didn't enjoy it, it's fine. We, we all laugh at those funny stories and these rules, but as we get into this, I, I think you do some self-evaluating because I think we all have these kind of silly rules and regulations in our own lives. Now, before we, I get into the text, I, I, I want to quickly point out some truths about legalism, some truths about legalism. The first, we usually think others are more legalistic than we are, okay? The fact is that we are all legalistic by nature. We like rules and regulations, and we, we, we tend to judge others by our standards, right? And what is and isn't acceptable. Basically, we think that our sin smells better than other people's. <laughs> I, I, I'm not bad as that guy, right? Secondly, legalism can spread quickly because we all like it. We all like so while in our minds it's usually less conscious than say maybe the Pharisees as they, legal as they were, but it can spread quickly. It, it can become like a viral outbreak in a congregation if, if we don't keep it in check. Third, legalism, it can squelch your faith, right? It can take away enthusiasm and joy and choke out any spiritual growth that you're having. Instead of finding freedom in, in Christ, many believers soon become burdened by the rules of the church. Fourthly, being legalistic usually makes one self-righteous and judgmental. Yes, this is one of the biggest downfalls of legalism. It, it majors in guilt and misguided sacrifice urging its followers to evaluate their relationship with God on the basis of standing and scores, right? On how their standards are set and their scores are set. And usually, we expect others to do the same, right? This, this shallow 
spirituality short circuits the works of grace from Christ and any growth. Fifth, legalism will make one narrow and divisive. That follows with being judgmental. I haven't met a judgmental person who's not narrow and divisive. The, see, the legalists insist that everyone live up to the standard that they have adopted. Like, how can you not do it that way, right? In other words, everyone needs to be just like me, and if they were, this world would be a better place. I know you all thought that one time or another. When, when, when we think this way, that we, we miss the beauty of diversity in the body of Christ. <laughs> That's some of the things we're studying in Sunday school class with, with Dr. Terry Smith, is the, the beauty of diversity in, in, our, in our personalities, right, in, in our gifts. Not everybody can be the same. Number six, legalism makes it extremely difficult, if not impossible, for people to see Jesus in us. There is nothing that pushes a seeker away faster than a list of rules and regulations that we set up for them, that we set up for them. Okay? Now, usually these lists of rules and regulations are not on the surface either, right? For many to, to look at and see, we don't usually hand them a booklet. Usually they mess up like, oh man, how could you possibly do that? We should know better. M many times we judge others with unwritten rules that we have set for ourselves, and so we judge others with them. For instance, while, while closing your eyes and, and kneeling during prayer, it might be a good thing to do that you do that can easily be the standard that we set to everybody how they pray. Oh, you better bow your heads, close your eyes, and kneel. If not, you're, God's not going to hear your prayer. All right? It, in short, if we're not careful, we'll default to a performance-based discipleship. And that's the last thing God wants. And that's exactly what's starting to happen here at the Church of Colossae. And it's not just the book of Colossians that actually addresses legalism, but Romans does, Galatians does, Hebrews does. We must be taught over and over again that everything we have is by grace. We're saved by grace, and we, we grow by grace. Nothing we do is earned. In, in, in our passage this morning, Paul argues that if we want to not worry about the do's and don'ts, we must focus on two truths. First, we must remember our rightful standing, and secondly, resist the traps of legalism. So first, remember our rightful standing, our rightful standing with Christ. See, our greatest defense against a performance-based faith is to remember our rightful standing before God. See, if we understand God's divine decree as a result of what Jesus has done in our behalf, we will experience that amazing grace and live with the freedom that is ours in Christ. As G Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 36, he says this, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So there, there are four truths here that all believers have and that shows us our, our rightful standing before God. Four truths. First is in verses 8 through 10. We are complete. We are complete. The phrase here in the beginning of verse 9, in Christ, shows us that, that Jesus is the center of God's saving activity. Okay? When, when we put our faith in Christ, we are included in what he has done. All the fullness of deity lives in Jesus. The phrase lives in bodily form means to dwell permanently, right? Jesus is not just a way to God. He is the only way because he is God himself. Last week at youth group, we watched a video where we're talking about eternity, and in that, the world says there's many ways to many paths to God. But what the world has wrong, not only are there not many paths to God, the way to God is not on a path, but through a person. 
and that's through Jesus Christ. Now, now listen carefully here. All believers are filled with the fullness of Christ. See, the tense of this verb in Greek tells us that this fullness is a permanent experience. It's not something that we go in and out of. If you're saved, you're saved. See, one translation actually puts it this way. And you are in him, having been completely filled full with the present result that you are in a state of fullness. If you have put your faith in Christ for forgiveness of your sins, then there is nothing lacking. You don't have to do anything else to get that relationship with God, to get your sins forgiven. Your sins have been completely forgiven by what Jesus has done on the cross. See, there's not some extra blessing or another experience you need to have. That is it. You have everything you need if you have Christ because the fullness of God comes into your life when you receive Jesus. You don't need anything more than what you already have. That should be a comforting thought. See, you merely need to understand and appropriate that which you already have and that which you already have been given. Secondly, the second truth here that all believers have is that we are alive. We are alive in Christ. I know we are alive might sound strange because you can look at yourself, yeah, I'm alive. But we're spiritually alive with Christ. See, God actually initiated circumcision. When he talks about circumcision in the Old Testament here, and, and, and uh, Paul has mentioned it again in these verses, God initiated circumcision in, in the Old Testament, and that was part of his covenant with his people in, in order to, to set them apart and identify them as his people, as his followers. Now, one of the problems of, of that, that's happening in Colossae here was that some of the legalists were demanding that Christians submit to circumcision and obey the Old Testament law. Now, I would be probably one of those guys fighting that legalistic law for many reasons. See, now, these, these false teachers were suggesting that obedience to the Old Testament rules would help them become more spiritual. Now, while, while circumcision was, was a physical procedure, it had some, had some real significance, and it wasn't because of the actual physical procedure. See, the problem was that it had become a religious act, and the change of heart wasn't taking place. See, these physical acts, they were never meant to be the substance of our faith. We can't say, well, I'm saved because I was baptized. And they can't say, I'm saved because I was circumcised. No, that's not what we base our faith on. Instead, a spiritual change on the inside that can only be accomplished through the redemptive work of Christ. That's what we base our faith on. That is what God desires. See, since we are alive in Christ and no longer dead in our sins, Paul next uses the illustration of a baptism. Now, the word baptize has both a literal and figurative meaning, and many churches kind of divide over this literal meaning, while I think the figurative meaning is what's important here. See, the literal meaning means to, to dip or immerse. That's what baptism, that's, that's what the word means. But the figurative meaning, this is the important part of baptism, is to be identified with. Right? Now, it's important to keep in mind that just as a, the physical act of circumcision did nothing to change someone's heart, so too the waters of baptism itself don't save anybody. Okay? It has to be a change of, of heart. However, water baptism, as Paul explains here, is, is a, wonder, a wonderful picture of, of an inner reality that has already happened. See, when we go under the water, we are symbolizing our burial with Christ. And when we come up, we become a picture of what it means to be risen with Christ. We died with him and we are raised with him and we have life, eternal life because of him. So, remembering that our old sinful nature is dead and buried with Christ gives us good reason to resist sin. We're not resisting sin because of the rules and regulations. We're resisting sin because we know we put our sinful nature to death. And Christ has now given us the power to resist his sin. 
Romans chapter 6, verses 11 to 14 gives us a good game plan to help us live in the freedom of Christ, where it says this, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. Thirdly, a third truth. Our sins are canceled. Praise God. See, here in these verses, we see that we're not only complete and alive, but our sins have been canceled. Notice that Jesus gave all. He gave all, forgave all of our sins. That means every single one of our sins, even the ones you have a hard time forgiving yourself for. He forgave all of them. Now, the written code that it talks about here, that, that's the law. And, and Jesus not only took our sins to the cross, this is really important. He also took the law, it says, and nailed it there. Took the written code and nailed it to the cross forever out of the way. The law was against us. It stood opposed to us because all it could ever do was point out our sinfulness, right? In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Paul concludes that he would not have known what sin was except through the law. Now, I, a few sermons back, right a few months ago, I used an a, a, a illustration of what the law is like. And I used this plumb line to show what the law is like. And this plumb line, what it does keeps everything straight and shows when something's crooked, when something's not put up against it, you can't tell if it's off center or not, or if it's leaning one way or the other. When you put something against it, this clearly shows that it's off center, that it's leaning to one side or the other. But this instrument in and of itself cannot do anything to change the fact that something is leaning the wrong way. All it does is it shows. And that's what the law does in our life. It just shows. It cannot save us. It cannot redeem us. And what God did was he took this instrument and he said, that's no longer needed. The price has been paid. Do not compare yourself to the law anymore. Grace has covered all your sins. The written code has been nailed to the cross. I have moved that out of the way. And then the written code here was, was like a, a handwritten ledger. Right? All of our sin and trespasses against the law were written against that, saying here's the law and here's his ledger. Okay, this is what you owe for breaking this law. Now in Bible times, records were kept on parchment. And this written code, this ink, it's not like today where you write something down and it can't be erased. This parchment, this ink could be erased off the parchment again. All right? And that's what Jesus did when he was erasing this. He was saying, your sins are forgiven. This rich in code is gone. It's completely wiped clean. Or, or in today's terms, we might, someone might know, you might even have a criminal record and getting that criminal record expunged where no one can ever see it again. It's clean. It can't be held against you. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. See, all of God's legal requirements had been met and, and nailed to the cross. No regulations or man-made rituals have power, us, power over us anymore. Isn't that a relief? Praise God. I know I'm relieved from that. And because of that, fourthly, we have victory. See, we have completeness in Christ. We have new life, and we have been completely forgiven. And finally, lastly, we have victory. Verse 15 is an amazing picture of Christ's triumph over, over evil. See, the word for disarmed is literally stripped, as in stripping a defeated enemy of armor on the battlefield. I, I 
love history, especially I'm drawn to uh, World War II history. I like watching videos about it and especially authentic stuff. And one of the, one of the, the videos that has drawn me in was after the U.S. defeated uh, uh, Japan and we completely disarmed them. To this very day, they are disarmed. We, we need to protect them, but they are disarmed. And what we did, we took their naval fleet and, and with some of our mothballed ships too, and we brought them to the Bikini Island and we dropped a gigantic bomb in the middle of them and they just got destroyed. That was this picture of they're completely disarmed. What you had can never be used again against us. That's what Jesus did against Satan. He completely disarmed him against us. The powers and authorities of this evil world stripped Christ, okay? They stripped Christ of his clothing of, and popularity, and they made a public spectacle of him on the cross and thought that they had triumphed over him by putting him to death. But little did they know that the victory actually belonged to Christ. They were doing what Jesus wanted them to do, what he needed to do. You see, evil no longer has any power over you because Christ has stripped Satan's weapons from him. He is disarmed. The only power he has is what we give him when we allow him to deceive us and create fear in our lives. Now, this is really neat. The, the cultural background to this verse is very rich in meaning. I think it's lost when we read it because we don't fully understand it. See, when the Romans went off to fight with their enemies and, and they won, they would bind their defeated enemies together by the hands and march them single file back to Rome where they would have a huge celebration there, right? Thousands of Romans would line the streets to watch this public spectacle of the Romans' army uh, a triumph and victory. So at the front of the parade would be the general, and then you would have maybe the, the heroes of the war, the ones who accomplished stuff. And following all of that would be the rest of the army, and then at the very end would be the defeated enemies. And these people would be humiliated, like losing was not bad enough. Then the Roman citizens would jeer at them and even throw things at them. You wouldn't want to be someone who lost to the Roman Empire. Now, Jesus, he's done the same thing. He's turned our captives, our captors of sin and death and Satan into captives, displaying them in his victory celebration. And the Colossians have participated in that victory, and so have we if we belong to Christ. See, we don't have to follow false teachers. We don't have to succumb to sin or fear Satan anymore. Jesus is the victor, and he has triumphed at the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54, or verse 54 through 57 say this, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Second, the second main point this morning is we need to resist the traps of legalism. Resist the traps of legalism. Those are the do's and don'ts. So let's, let's quickly go over how to resist the traps of legalism. Galatians chapter, two, chapter 3, verses 2 through th uh, 3 puts it well. It says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Verse 16 to 23 gives us three warnings so that we can avoid being foolish. I don't want to look foolish to you. <laughs> First, we need to refuse to judge by externals. If you don't want to look foolish, we need to refuse to judge by externals. So, so Paul is drawing a conclusion here based upon what he has just written previously. Since Jesus has done what was necessary for our salvation, then don't let other people evaluate your spiritual life by the external standards we set up for ourselves. And the opposite is true as well. Let's not judge others by the standards that we set up for ourselves. Food restrictions, 
special diets, observances or ceremonies and, and holy days, they all rose out of specific practices in the Old Testament. They were, however, just shadows, as it says here, just shadows of the reality that is fulfilled in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10 and the first part of verse 1 puts it clearly when it says this, the law is only a shadow of good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. Now, I would say it's pretty easy to judge by externals, right? I have to admit, I do it all the time. It's part of human nature. You see somebody, you immediately judge them. What they're probably going to be like. <coughs> After all, we, we naturally judge others, right? By, by what we experience. By maybe just our physical senses, what we can see, what we hear, what we taste. And what we touch. Now, God told Samuel when he was looking for the replacement king of of Israel, replacing Saul, to not go by outward appearances. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, God says this to Samuel, man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, we must be aware and, and make a conscious effort to not evaluate others by what they are doing or not doing. That first point I could practice that the rest of my life and not fully conquer it. Secondly, we need to reject false authority. See, these verses tell us about certain people to avoid so that we ourselves are not disqualified. And you're like, well, you just said don't judge others. How are we supposed to avoid somebody if not supposed to judge them? Well, I think through the power of the Holy Spirit, he would reveal to us, and we don't judge them, we don't hate them, and say, we're not going to listen to them. Now, Paul describes these people in four ways. And this, this is a good set uh, standards to follow. They have false humility, right? They present themselves as humble and holy, but in reality, they are filled with spiritual pride and superiority. One of the things I, I love about my son Isaac is he always seems humble to me. He loves life, but when you like point it out to him and, and you say how good he is, he kind of just, and he sucks his bottom lip in, and he doesn't know how to respond. <laughs> and I just love that humble spirit about him. He, he's not doing it for the attention. He's not doing it for the praise. He just loves life and wants to do what he does. Now, I, I think that sometimes we, we can have those kind of outward appearances and say, you know, there is a humbleness about this person. Secondly, they worship angels. I mean, when they worship angels, that's pretty obvious, but that's what, that's what Paul said here. But let me just break it out a little bit more for you. Their, their focus is on other spiritual beings rather than on Christ. He said, oh, yeah, you know, it, it's, we're, we're, we, we believe in, in a higher power. We believe, you know, that there's spiritual beings out there that affect us. You know, we believe there's multiple paths to God and we just have to tap into the correct authority. But they never mention Christ. There is a problem. Thirdly, they, they have seen visions. They have these mystical insights and they say, I got it from a vision I saw. They, they love to give people the latest word from God. They say, hey, I, I got a special word from you, from, from God. When someone comes to me and says, I say, you know what? I got a pretty clear communication channel to God myself. He could talk to me. <laughs> now, if someone comes to me and reaffirms what God already has given to me, then I'm like, all right, God, I think you're really trying to tell me something. But that's how, how God usually works. He doesn't come with one special person and say, I am, I am the one telling you what to do. <laughs> Especially if there's a lot about the Bible. Fourthly, they are, they are puffed up with, with idle notions, right? They're inner secrets. They have a special word. It gives them big heads, and not, but not burning hearts. As, as a result, because of their subjective bias and experiential expressions, they had actually become disconnected from the head, from Christ. They disconnect themselves. They 
were severed from any hope of spiritual life because they were not getting their orders from Christ. See, we must make sure we are not seeking experiences and that we do not, that they do not correlate with Christ. Even though there may be this fascination with religious mysticism, right, these things of the unknown, our focus must always be on Jesus. Now, I'm not a big book reader. Like, I don't go out and find books of fiction and all these other books and, and just read them. I'm not saying it's bad if you do, because that's great. Um, but I'm just not really into a lot of those books. But there are a lot of books out there that say many good things and can help you study the Bible. But they can never be a substitute to the Bible. Now, I usually have to remind myself of that. So that when I'm reading and, and something, when I read one of these books, and something doesn't line up with what I believe to be a biblical truth, I, I can sift through that, right, and, and send it out and still glean the, the truth and the good from what the person, the author might be saying. Now, about uh, 20 months ago or so, um, Jay gave me a book to read. I should probably give it back to you by now, but <laughs> I'm going to keep hanging. He's nodding yes. <laughs> he has a lot of notes in there. Um, it, it has given me a, a, a lot of insight and really reminded me of where my focus and study needs to be. The, the title of the book is Sola Scriptura. Now, that means that the Bible alone is the standard and measurement for everything. That was the cry of the Reformation, and I believe it is a cry that must be reiterated again in this generation. If we do, it will be easy for us to see false teachers and prophets and those who sound like they're speaking the truth, but in reality are preaching a completely different gospel than what we believe in. There is an author, by the, his name is, is Rob Bell. And I don't like to throw authors under the bus, but he was somebody who, on the surface, looked really good, said all the right things, and his books, 99% of them lined up with the Bible. Until so recently, he said, you know, I don't really think there's a hell. And then he said, you know, who are we to say that someone who doesn't know Jesus can't make it to heaven? And I said, all right, buddy, now you crossed the line. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have his books, but as a reminder to me that someone could look and be very close to the truth. And those are the most dangerous and deceptive ones. And the only way to know that they're not preaching the truth is to be buried in the word of God and know what is authentic. Thirdly, we, we must repudiate religious rules, right? Push them back, these religious rules. Verse 20 to 23 asks the question of why we would still submit ourselves to man-made rules and regulations. The false teachers, they, they focused on personal denial as the way to help them stop sinning and falling into temptation. Now, this sounds really good on the surface because we all agree that we need discipline in our lives, right? We could discipline ourselves. I must be doing better. But, but they were teaching that these disciplines were necessary for fellowship with God. That's completely false. Paul tells us that we don't belong to the world anymore. We don't get to heaven by following a list of do's and don'ts. You're not going to get to heaven and God say, well, no, you messed up on that one. Sorry. You're out. Okay? We, we don't live the Christian life that way. We cannot earn God's favor. All we can do is receive it. Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. He said, I have found in my own spiritual life that the more rules I lay down for myself, the more sins I commit. That goes back to what the law does, right? The law just points out all what you've done wrong, but you don't need to follow these. You don't have to be strict and follow these rules and say, I'm doing this to, to honor, to, to earn my salvation with God. That price has been paid. Verse 23 states very clearly that regulations 
though they may look and sound good, lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Have you guys ever noticed that? When you try to resist something, the more you resist, the more it's in your mind, and the more, the better chance there is for you to fall into that temptation. Like you have a piece of cake you're not supposed to eat because you're on a special diet, and it's in your refrigerator. And you open it up. So I just want to look at it. I want to look at it again. Let me just take a little bite so satisfy my, next thing you know, the whole thing is gone, and you're starting another cake. And you just give up. See, rules don't abolish the appetite because they, they feed the flesh. Now, why is that? Because no matter how hard we work, we can't force sin out of our lives through devotion, through man-made dictates. We need God's power working within us. It's his grace, not a regimen of rules and activities that affect real life change. We must teach grace before commitment because once grace is understood and embraced, it will lead to commitment. But required commitment and rule keeping always leads to legalism. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 12 reads, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. As we close, I want to ask you some self-evaluating questions. First, are you focused on yourself or on Christ? Are you a list keeper or a grace giver? Is your faith anchored to personal experiences or on the word of God? And fourthly, do you feel set free or are you tied up by the do's and don'ts of this life? Christianity is not a matter of what you do or what you don't do. Christianity is what is done for you. It's not spelled D-O, rather D-O-N-E. It is done. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. The price has been paid. The debt has been erased. You are complete in Christ. You are alive. Your sins are forgiven. And you have the victory. So let us hand over all of our self-imposed man-made list to God right now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, I want to thank you first and foremost for what your son Jesus did on the cross for us. Lord, I thank you that we don't have to earn our salvation because that is impossible. I thank you that your grace is endless, knowing that even as we mess up as we walk through this life, that you continue to forgive us and that we cannot pull ourselves out of your graces. Lord, I pray for anyone here who might not have fully surrendered lives to you, that they will do so, Lord, and that they can live under the freedom knowing that you love us unconditionally. And Lord, as we continue and close our time this morning, I pray that we can remember that throughout this week and throughout our life, Lord, and that we can Share your love with others as we show grace to them as well. And I pray this in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our final hymn this morning. I know it has the word grace. Grace.